Well, welcome, everybody. It's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, this afternoon. This is the concluding uh, Pat Ledden Memorial Faculty Luncheon Seminar of this academic year. And it's also the conclusion, concluding seminar of our uh, topic for the environment. Uh, so our speaker, Dr. Joseph Buxtein, is a, a longtime member of the faculty at UCSD in the School of Medicine. Uh, he was formerly the head of cardiovascular radiologists, radiology and professor of radiology from 1974 to 1994. He's, he's very widely known for his pioneering work in introducing angiography in the United States. Angiogra angiography is medical imaging technique where x-rays are used to image uh, the interior of blood vessels. He's also pioneered the introduction of interventional radiology, which is the general term for uh, non-invasive or minimally invasive imaging techniques. You're probably more familiar with the terms x-ray fluoroscopy, uh, CD, CT scans, um, ultrasound, MRIs, very important uh, diagnostic imaging techniques. Well, having experienced a very distinguished and prolific career uh, as a researcher in radiology with over 360 publications, his interests turned after retirement to broader but not unrelated topics. Uh, they include population issues, nuclear issues, and social responsibility. So maybe you can see the connection now uh, to the talk that we are going to uh, have the privilege of hearing, and that is today's lecture topic, Global Warming, the Population Connection. Uh, please welcome Dr. Buxtein. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Marjorie, for the kind introduction. This lecture is uh, brought to you through the life of Patrick Ledden. I did not, <clears throat> I hardly knew Pat Ledden during life, but have learned something about him from reviewing commentaries from friends and colleagues. And uh, these are a few of the comments that were made uh, about him. My favorite comment is this one, a gentleman and a gentleman. And thank you, Sally, uh, also for developing this series of lectures and making it possible for me to address this group. My subject is global warming, the population connection. You may wonder why a radiologist is talking about these two subjects. I've been interested in the, pop, the, the problem of overpopulation since uh, my teens, as many of you probably were. Um, also wrote my senior paper in medical school on contraception, was an early member of zero population growth, and watched, uh, disturbingly, the population continue to grow despite many efforts uh, during the last century. But it became uh, apparent that there was a real connection between the newly recognized global warming and world overpopulation, and it looked like uh, population might lead to the developments of important arguments uh, against global warming and vice versa, that global warming could lead to important and renewed arguments against population growth and could lead to renewed efforts efforts that have been partially abandoned later uh, in the latter portion of the last century. In my own case, it's kind of, there's another uh, area of interest, it's kind of ironical, that uh, 25 years ago when I was one of the founding members of San Diego Chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility, we were very concerned about a post-nuclear war global catastrophe secondary to 
worldwide fires and soot that would lead to cold and darkness and uh, lead to a scenario called nuclear winter. And now 25 years ago, 25 years later, we're facing a global catastrophe of equal proportions, in my view, one that is coming on more slowly than we, than we anticipated nuclear winter might come on, but one that is equally disastrous in the long run. And it's caused by the opposite effect. Instead of, uh, over, instead of uh, too much cooling, of course, too much heating. So that's how I got interested in this subject. There's really uh, very little doubt anymore about the existence of global warming, but just in case. <laughs> I'm going to summarize my subject a little bit for you. It is widely assumed that global warming is due to burning of fossil fuels. But that's not the primary cause. That's only the, pro the, 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 that's the proximate cause. The primary cause of global warming is the wants and needs of the 6.7 billion people that now occupy the Earth. And although much of the effort to contain global warming is directed at technological measures, such as nuclear power, solar power, wind power, and uh, automobile mileage adjustments, uh, those technical methods cannot do the job, in my opinion. They can help, but they cannot do the job until, unless at the same time we stabilize and probably have to reduce human population. This slide is a wonder to me, and many of you have probably seen a slide like this. This slide demonstrates data taken from uh, ice cores drilled more than two miles deep in the Antarctica. And we have been able, man has been able, to analyze the bubbles in the, ga in the, in the ice and determine the concentration of carbon dioxide and by looking at the isotopes of hydrogen in the bubbles, also the temperature uh, existing at that time, and this is 420,000 years ago. So we have a trace from 420,000 years ago to the present. And we can see this remarkable parallelism between the concentration of carbon dioxide in red and the global temperatures, which averaged usually down here a little less than current temperatures. Most of the time, global temperature has been well below the median temperature of the last century, which we've called zero on this graph. But note that the concentration of carbon dioxide now has very rapidly climbed beyond any level that has ever been detected in past history, and we've gone back now to over 800,000 years through these ice cores. This slide, I think, reflects a significant characteristic of our species. The amazing intelligence that we have to be able to interpret this data and develop this data from 800,000 years ago. We are an amazing species. And yet, also reflecting the breadth of our abilities to respond, the folly, the folly of failing to recognize the importance of this information and to act upon it. So human beings have this tremendous ability, this tremendous breadth of possible potential behaviors. That's one of the remarkable things about our species and one of the things that makes it worthwhile to try to keep our species intact. Let's look at some slides. You've probably seen some like this. This is a broader scale, broader time scale. And we can see that the carbon dioxide concentrations are continuing to rise, and they're rising ever so more steeply with time. Now we are gaining about two parts per million uh, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere every year. And the current level is about 387 parts per million.
gone up from about 320. At the beginning of the industrial age, the concentration was probably about 250. And this little swiggle represents seasonal changes in the uh, concentration. Now, roughly paralleling, roughly I emphasize, roughly paralleling the uh, rise in carbon dioxide concentrations is the temperature, especially since about the middle of the last century. And we can see uh, this, the red line is the medium tem temperature at the surface of the Earth, or near the surface of the Earth, uh, climbing about 7 tenths of a degree centigrade in the past uh, 50 or 60 years. It's about 7 tenths of a degree centigrade. Doesn't sound like a big number, but you're already aware of the significant effects of this relatively modest rise in temperature on the entire global climate, animals, and plants. And so it was assumed that the, uh, re the rise in carbon dioxide concentration um, led to the rise in global temperature. And nobody was paying much attention to the rise in global population that was occurring at the same time. About uh, 1850, there was a billion people in the world. And by about the time I was born in 1930, there was about two billion people. And then the population began to increase exponentially. We now have 6.7 billion people in the world. It is anticipated by the United Nations for reasons that are not clear to me that the population numbers will plateau at the, about uh, 10 billion in the year about 2100. Currently, world population is growing over 1% per year. This is a number that's worth remembering, 1.17% increase per year. And if we take those three data curves and superimpose them and adjust the scales, we can see that there's a, another parallelism. The population in black parallels the carbon dioxide in blue and roughly parallels the global temperatures. And it is not unreasonable to presume that it is the population initially that through the activities of human beings that leads to the increased output of carbon dioxide from every single human activity, including breathing, and that that in turn leads to the increased global temperature. So let's look a little bit in more detail at the uh, amount of greenhouse gases that are being emitted. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a very important group. About 1,500 of the world's foremost climatologists have been meeting uh, for the past couple of decades. And their last report came out uh, last year and concerned the emissions of greenhouse gases in 2004. And they concluded that there are 49 billion tons of carbon dioxide or gases that have effects equivalent to carbon dioxide in some respect every year, 49 billion tons. And the major gas, of course, is carbon dioxide. Methane is another important gas, and there are a few other important gases. But the important thing about their report, and contrary to our general understanding in the United States, is that more than half of the greenhouse gases are emitted from the less developed countries the LDCs, less developed countries, and 45% from the more developed MDC countries. And this is very important because it suggests that the high-tech solutions alone that are generally being promoted in the United States and elsewhere in the developed world are insufficient because they are relatively inapplicable in the LDCs in which live 80% of world population. So what are we going to do about these greenhouse gases? There was an important article that came out in Scientific American in September of 2006 uh, from a group of a couple of uh, physicists from Columbia Universities. And uh, they came up with 15 different ideas uh, that, if enacted, could lead to stabilization of emissions, 
stabilization of emissions of greenhouse gases, keeping emissions at the 49 billion tons every year, year that we produced in 2004. But while we're producing those 49 billion tons, concentrations of these gases in the atmosphere would continue to rise. Anyway, you can't read this slide, so we'll look a little more detail here at a couple of them. There's a lot of hope, hype, and hyperbole uh, in association with each one of these wedges. These are called the mitigating wedges. Um, and I have a secret weapon for uh, investigating the truth of each of these wedges. It's called arithmetic. Each of these wedges was supposed to save 92 billion tons of CO2 in 50 years. And seven or eight wedges would be needed to maintain carbon dioxide at the current levels of emission for 50 years, though the atmospheric concentration would still rise, as I mentioned. Let's look at number one. Increase fuel economy of the billion cars from 30 to 60 miles per gallon. There's a tremendous amount, a very expensive effort going toward increasing automobile mileage per gallon. So what would happen? Road vehicles in the world, and this is a worldwide problem now, road vehicles in the world produce 2.5 billion tons, that's a metric ton, of CO2 in 2004. 2.5 billion produced by automobiles, over 49 billion tons totally of anthropogenic e emissions, 5% of global greenhouse gases. And if we doubled the mileage of automobiles, we would reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by 2.5%. And that amount of improvement would be nullified in just two years by the 1.17% population growth that we have now. And worse yet, if we used electric cars, but the electricity was generated by coal-fired plants, which are the worst offenders, there would be little or no saving in CO2 emissions at all. And again, there's a lot of emphasis being placed on compact fluorescent lighting. Global replacement in the world's homes would decrease greenhouse gases by about a half a percent. And if we replaced all the lights in the world, all the incandescent lights in the world, we might gain three to five percent. And again, in a couple of years, three to five years, uh, all that advantage would be nullified. Let's go on to carbon capture and storage. There's a lot of evidence, uh, effort in this country to try to save the coal industry uh, by capturing the emissions from coal-fired plants, because they are the worst offenders by twofold worse per unit of energy generated, say, compared to uh, oil and natural gas, especially natural gas. And there was to be a new plant tested in the United States to begin in January, but for some reason that was canceled. There are in the world now no plants uh, that are capturing the carbon emissions from coal-fired power plants. There are a few plants that are capturing the emissions from oil and gas plants, but none from coal-fired plants. The coal, and if we were able to capture the, uh, these emissions from coal-fired plants, it was estimated that it would increase uh, fuel consumption by 20 to 40 percent because it takes a lot of energy to uh, recapture that carbon dioxide, leading to a 60 percent increase in the cost of energy from coal and considerably diminishing the price advantage of using coal for generating electrical energy. And coal has other negative effects. It's, it's really poisonous to the atmosphere and releases mercury, sulfur, and nitrous oxides. So coal is something that many countries are trying to get rid of completely as far as power generation. Now, what about nuclear power? As a I was a founding member, as I told you, of Physicians for Social Responsibility, and Physicians for Social Responsibility have always taken a position totally against nuclear weapons and nuclear power. But I've changed my mind to some extent myself about nuclear power. 
Right now, nuclear power supplies about a sixth of all the world's electrical energy. So I think we're going to have to depend on nuclear power for the foreseeable future. Let's see if nuclear power can make up for the increased population that we're expecting in the next 50 years. The answer is probably no. In 2050, we expect about 9.1 billion people. That's a 36% increase in the total world population. We would need this number of big plants, not the biggest, but pretty big nuclear plants in 42 years to provide them with the energy they're going to use if they maintain their energy needs at their present level. And this is unlikely. Probably they will at least double their per capita energy demand. It seems well beyond current world capacity to produce an average of 32 units per year, although we could scale up probably to that level with tremendous uh, amounts of money. Right now, the world is producing five or six nuclear plants every year. The cost at $3 a watt, which is sort of an optimistic number, would be $4 trillion just to take care of the new population, not even to consider the possibility of using nuclear power to replace coal plants that are decommissioned. And again, as you all know, there are serious concerns with waste, accidents, and terrorists. It's very difficult still in the United States to get approval to build a nuclear plant. Uh, and this is a serious uh, factor in slowing the uh, acceptance of new nuclear facilities. Wind. There's been a lot of wind about wind. And right now, it's, uh, the use of wind is increasing rapidly now produces about 2 to 3 percent of energy, of electrical energy in the world. And that's increased about tenfold in the past, uh, in the past decade. But again, a prodigious uh, investment in time and money and energy. We'd need a million two megawatt towers in the United States to supply about half of our needs, nominally they say. The problem with wind is the nominal power of these wind turbines is only is about four times as great as their actual power output because of the variability of wind. And so because you can't count on wind, you have to maintain backup or develop and still to be developed expensive storage systems uh, for storing the electricity. And so it's not possible to really decommission a lot of conventional power plants when you add the capacity of wind because the wind is unreliable. The same is true pretty much of photovoltaics. Photovoltaics are very promising and now uh, increasingly supplying some global electricity, but it's still under 1%. They're very expensive still, although that price may well come down. It, they're now uh, about $25 per watt, but it's thought that the price might come down to $4 per watt or maybe even $2 per watt by some claims. But again, it's intermittent, and we have to have conventional backup and storage facilities. And these the storage facilities really have not been well developed yet. The durability, again, of wind and also photovoltaics is not great, 20 to 30 years. And before we ever build out the whole system uh, for wind and solar, we're going to have to use some of that productivity to replace the uh, equipment that has already begun to fail. And huge areas are required for solar. Uh, we would need, in the United States, about three-eighths the areas of Arizona. Each one of these solar panels requires glass. This would require probably more glass, much more glass, than already exists in the United States in all the houses and buildings. Finally, biofuels. There's been a lot of uh, hype about biofuels. Um, the worst thing you can do, going down here to the red bar, is convert forest to cropland as far as carbon dioxide emissions are concerned. With each air acre of conversion, you would lose the absorptive capacity from the trees, which take up a lot of carbon dioxide. You would lose 81 tons of carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere. On the other hand, if you took cropland in the tropics and converted it back to forest, you'd save about 68 tons 
of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And using cropland for ethanol from corn is about a wash, nearly a wash. You don't really save much. It requires so much energy to convert the corn into uh, ethanol. So in summary of these wedges, all 15 and many, many others that have been suggested, each wedge represents a prodigious effort. Unproven, time-consuming, expensive technology not really applicable in the less developed countries. And even if developed, insufficient, like, like the increase in mileage of cars, insufficient to really have much of an impact. The big problem with the wedges, population was not seriously considered in the wedges, and hardly anybody seriously considers population. But we're going to seriously consider population now. <laughs> That's why I'm here. No scientific or technical breakthrough was required to use population control, population reduction, to gain a handle on these global emissions. And compared to some of the costs that I've shown you before, relatively inexpensive to reduce world population. And world population has been reduced before, at least population in various countries, has been voluntarily reduced in many countries. So this has been done before. It's not like carbon capture and storage, which really has not been done on a commercial level before. Countries have voluntarily re reduced their population. It has been done before. Let's look at the per capita production of greenhouse gases in the world. In the more developed countries, every year, 17 tons of greenhouse gases per person. And in the United States, we are the leaders, estimated 28 and a half tons per person. And in a 75-year lifetime, which we have more than that actually in the United States now, 1,300 tons in a 75-year lifetime per person. In the, leftist, in the less developed countries, 5.3 tons equivalent but there's a lot more of them, and the average emission is about 345 tons in a 65-year lifetime. So let's look at our carbon dioxide footprint in the United States. If you really want to do something, everybody wants to do something, Schwarzenegger says, what can we do? What can you do? Let's look at our own footprints. Low wattage light bulbs, 11 tons you'll save in your lifetime if you would use low wattage life bulbs. Doubling auto miles, 2075 tons per capita. If you keep your hot water a little less hot, you keep your house a little bit uh, colder in the winter and hotter in the summer, you'll save about 93 tons, no big deal. If you put in solar panels on your house, maybe 200 tons per house in a 75 year lifetime. Now, these flights that we take to all our scientific meetings, they're beginning to have an impact that's 120 tons if you cut out two of those meetings. And if you're flying overseas, you take one meeting a year and you give it up, you'll save 360 tons in a lifetime. But if you have less children, one less child, you'll save 2,135 or more tons in a lifetime. And that is the way that you as individuals, or younger people probably, and that's why I'm so anxious to speak to the university students. And that's why we went to all the trouble and expense of taping this talk today. Uh, we want the young people to realize that if they really want to make a difference themselves personally, um, that uh, this is the best way of doing it. Now, I don't want you all to think I'm a curmudgeon, that I don't like babies. I got three kids of my own, and they each have two kids. So we get that makes six. And they are awful cute, and it's easy to understand why people want to have a lot of babies, especially when they're this age. Uh, but we can't always do what we want to do. And we're going to have to give up this pleasure, I think, for the next century or two to have as many children as we want. We can still have children. We can't have as many as we want if we're going to save civilization and make it possible for babies like this to be born over the next thousand years or more. 
Now, of course, the way to reduce population, the best way is to reduce fertility. And world fertility now is, that's the number of women, of children per woman, is 2.59, leading to a growth rate worldwide of 1.17%. And the total fertility rates raise, uh, vary all over the place. In some African countries, 5.3. In Hong Kong, under one child per woman. Some other interesting figures. The United States, we're at 2.09, just about or slightly above replacement level. Um, much of this gain is, much of this uh, gain in population is due to immigration. Uh, China, with their one child policy, is down to about 1.75 children per woman on the average. The policy is incompletely effective. But Iran, look at this. Iran has come down to 1.71 uh, in a period of years and has a population growth rate of much less than ours. And in Russia, 1.39, they are losing a half a percent per year of population. Now, contraception is the best way, probably, of reducing total fertility rate. And the important points on this slide are, one, that the two most frequently used contraceptive methods are female sterilization and IUD. But very importantly, there's uh, almost 40 percent of the woman, women in the country are not using any contraception at all. And in most cases, it's because contraception is illegal or seriously discouraged in those countries. Now, I debated about whether to talk about abortion or not, but it must be talked about to convey the whole message, to convey the whole truth. The data is not very reliable, but here are some typical numbers. In Russia, they have the, that very low total fertility rate. 63% of pregnancies end in abortion. In China and the United States, about a quarter of pregnancies. And when we get down to India, a very small fraction of pregnancies end in abortion. But it is important to realize that a significant fraction of any gain the world might have made in slowing the rate of population growth is partially attributable to abortions. And no country that has reduced its fertility rate below two has been able to do it without both contraception and readily available abortion. In Iran, they had a fertility rate of 5.5 in 1989. It is 1.7 in 2006. That shows you how fast the total fertility rate can be brought down. And how did they do it? One way they did it was couples must take a course in contraception before marriage. That might be an easy thing to introduce in the United States. In Mexico, the TFR dropped from 6.8 in 1970 to 2.4 in 2006. 25 countries have absolutely decreasing populations, including Germany, Poland, and Russia. And again, we were able to get, the, the people were able to get the TFR in Hong Kong down to below one. So let's see what we might gain by reducing TFR globally. Here is the current TFR of 2.59. If we were able to reduce it just modestly to 2.35, uh, that doesn't do much good. At 2.05, there's a slight bump here because of population momentum, and then population stabilizes at around 9 billion. Still too many, and time is short. If we get down to 1.85, we do then begin to develop serious decrease in world population, uh, but relatively slowly, and speed is of the essence. Because there are all kinds of positive feedback mechanisms that are playing a role, and here are just a few of them. The decreased albedo, that's the reflectivity of the Earth, of, of solar, of sunlight, decreases. Ice reflects sunlight, and as the ice melts, there's decreased reflection of that sunlight, it sticks around more and raises global temperatures more. Melting of permafrost, there's a lot of vegetation under that permafrost, and it becomes exposed and decays. 
Ocean warmer, warming decreased, decreases the CO uptake of algae as the ocean gets too warm. And forest fires, that's a big problem. There's increasing numbers of forest and peat fires. They release tremendous amounts of CO2, and then the forest is not available then for at least 40 or 75 years to take up carbon dioxide. So many serious positive feedbacks. So what can we do to speed up Decrease pop, de de the decrease in population even faster. There's one slide showing what might be accomplished in the world if we reduced the global TFR to one. And that's a target. If we shoot for the stars, we might reach the moon. It's a target, I think, to shoot for. Here is immediately the population would stabilize and then rapidly fall. And at some point, we would have to the world, if it wanted to keep people going, would have to, again, uh, reinstate a 2.05 uh, TFR, but around the year 2060. The world population would be down to about 4.4 billion. And if we didn't do anything, the world population would continue to go up like that to its about 9.6 now, extrapolating from UN figures to the year 2058. So down to 4.4 billion, 55% below the projected population of 9.5 billion in 2058, saving a lot of CO2 equivalent to 12.5 of those wedges that I showed you earlier. Remember, those physicists were just shooting for eight wedges, seven or eight wedges. Here we can get 12 and a half wedges just by reducing world population to that amount. So can we stay in the green? We want to stay, we want to stay green. We want to keep civilization uh, fairly comfortable. What can we accomplish? If we have an average TFR of one and we achieve eight wedges, in the year 2058, we'll have decreased CO2 emissions, emissions by 62%. The CO2 concentration in the air anticipated about 420 parts per million. Right now, as I mentioned, it's 387 as of April. And the temperature would go up from its current level, from where we are now, about 1.2 to 1.6 more degrees which is still a livable, probably a livable temperature. Livable for humans, maybe not for polar bears. If we didn't adjust our population, we just achieved the wedges and the population rose over 9 billion, there'd be no change in the emissions. CO2 concentrations would rise further and temperatures would rise probably about three degrees centigrade. And if we didn't do anything, which is the situation, basically almost the situation now. Something is being done, but not much. Uh, business as usual. Then the CO2 concentrations, it is estimated by the IPCC, would go up this amount, CO2 concentrations by this amount, and temperatures would probably become unlivable in major portions of the entire globe. Perhaps the poles would remain habitable. Well, you may not be surprised to learn that there are some forces that are opposed to reducing birth <coughs> rates. And uh, some of them are here, religion, conservative morality, economic interests, I think, play a very important role. People are worried about the economy, and our president has said he will do whatever is necessary to control global warming, so long as it does not interfere with our economy. National racial ethnic sensitivities, nurture and sexual instincts, and defeatist attitudes. A lot of people think there's nothing we can do, nothing we can do about population. But opposing these traditional forces, there are many modern factors that are promoting birth control. First of all, it's, there's widespread availability, safety and acceptability of voluntary contraception, sterilization, and even abortion. All these things are new since the last century. There's all sorts of activities for women nowadays besides just bringing up babies. There's uh, vocations and avocations, all kinds of hobbies, politics, as you might be aware of recent, from recent activity. Uh, 
People in the cities particularly are aware of the economic costs of children and same-sex marriage is being accepted and being voluntarily child-free is becoming an important player in this whole question and I'll talk about that more later. But I think very important is peer pressure from recognition of the connection between global warming and repopulation. And if everybody starts becoming aware of the fact that population and global warming are connected, that these droughts and these heat waves and this food shortage is related to population, I think sentiment will become irresistible in favor of population stabilization and reduction. <clears throat> there have been wars in the past that most of us are not aware of, population wars in the last century. Billions of dollars coming from the United States in particular to try to contain global population, particularly in Indian and the less developed countries. And we learned a number of lessons from those efforts because they were by and large not successful. We learned that the most important thing in achieving population control is that women must want fewer children. Somehow we've got to convince women to want fewer children. It involves education for, children, for women, empowerment for women. We must use little or no coercion in democracies. We can't use the Chinese method of forced population reduction or stabilization. In the past, from the United States even, induced by the United States, there were forced sterilizations and forced abortions in India, particularly. And gen this generated tremendous amounts of uh, re resentment. And was one of the reasons that Indira Gandhi was not reelected about 1965. Uh, and the politicians have become afraid to touch uh, pressure against population because of some of the past political disasters. So we can't use coercion. And the population control methods that were used in the, mid in the mid 20th century were frequently staffed by untrained people and there was a lot of infections and there was significant mortality from introduction of um, intrauterine devices or vas ligations. And we must have well-trained people uh, involved in these programs. Okay, how do we motivate women to want fewer children. Well, we now know more about motivation, and it's very clearly apparent that emotions are the dominant player in, determine, in making decisions. So we have to use all the tools we have for generating the emotions. Now, some of the best people at generating emotions are our marketing professionals, and they can make you raise skirts, lower skirts, use underarm deodorant, all kinds of things. We have to put them to work on something really important, trying to motivate women to have fewer children. I think we must use fear. We used fear during the nuclear issues. We were talking all, all over the place about the terrible consequences of nuclear explosions. We should, can use fear again for a justifiable purpose. We should use images of small families. This has all been tried before. All this stuff down here has been used before. We have to continue to use it. And we have to talk about the possibility of being child-free. This is something that most mother-in-laws, for example, wouldn't even consider for a moment. I mean, this is an example of some of the stuff that the marketing professionals can sell. And if they can sell this stuff, they ought to be able to maybe play a role in selling population reduction. Here's a picture from one of the fires we had in San Diego. It could have been taken in Greece also last year. Those fires added about, as I calculate, about a half percent of total global emissions of carbon dioxide. We can show pictures like this, the small, typical happy family on vacation. As I said, this has been used in the past. And we can show these wonderful child-free couples. <laughs> wonder why I had my three children now when I look at some of these slides. Okay, being voluntarily child-free is becoming an important player. 6% of U.S. Ever, ever married women choose to be child-free, and the figure is about 20% in several other countries. It's estimated that voluntary child-freeness will soon approach 30% in the more developed countries. 
And keep this in mind, if 30% of the women have no children, then 30% of the women can have two children if they want. And that would still keep child average at one child. So intellectual approaches also play a role, and I don't have time to really go into that. There's all sorts of rational reasons uh, for, uh, that benefit the wife and mother, that benefit the children and family, and benefit the community and globe, the entire globe, and I don't have time to go into those. It's also important to, de to develop arguments refuting pronatal arguments. You can refute the religious argument. You can refute the economic argument and defeatist arguments. I'll give you an example of a couple of those. The Archbishop of Canterbury says with respect to global warming, there are choices we can make, each one of us, to change things now. And I think what the Bible and the Christian tradition suggests that those who ignore that challenge and the evidence bear a heavy responsibility before God. Or you can talk to your friends about if preserving, if you're religious, God's creation, the earth, preserving, if you're religious, God's creation, mankind, and life, leave the world a better place than you found it, and a technique, that, an argument that I've developed, I'll discuss later in private, the million-year pro-life resolve. So there are arguments that can be developed against religion. The economic concerns. I think it is true that the world economy will decrease along with population retreat. But so what? That's, that's, that's okay, there'll be less people, we don't have to have as big an economy. But the worker per capita income could increase. Excessive population dependent demand can lead to severe economic stress, such as we're seeing with the demand for oil and the demand for food. So, so there's severe economic stress produced by overpopulation. But the take-home message, it's so simple that only a child can understand it. If civilization collapses, the economy collapses with it. What could be simpler? Defeatist attitudes. Contraception has proved effective wherever it has become available. Anytime you introduce free availability, easy availability into a country, into a country it's taken up. 25 countries now have decreasing population, and we've demonstrated the success of women's education and empowerment in reducing fertility. Leadership must come from the more developed countries. Global warming requires a global cure. We can't be satisfied with just fixing things up in California. Population policies must be applied equally to all countries, races, and religions. We can't accept one country claiming disproportionate persecution, one race or religion claiming disproportionate persecution. Everybody has to be treated by similar guidelines globally. The more developed countries must serve as green exemplars. That's us. We've got to start showing the world that we can contain our own population as well as our own <coughs> emissions of global warming gases. And we have to provide an army of teachers Consultation, technical and financial support were needed. The aid must be dependent on cooperation and compliance with population aims, the carrot and stick approach, unfortunately. We have to use a little bit of coercion there. Specific population policies, empower women. That's a very important part of this whole business. Require a course in contraception before marriage, heterosexual marriage, that is. Assure the availability of adequate family planning facilities. And when needed, subsidize contraception, tubal ligation, vasectomy, and abortion. It's going to require quite a change in our thinking. We need role models. Women's role models play an important role. This is Maxine Waters, a Congress congressional representative from California. And the role model of role models, guess who? <laughs> Look how far you can go when you only have one child. I think this slide should be taken to Saudi Arabia so they can appreciate the whimsy, the wiliness, the beauty that's being hidden under all those burqas. <laughs> Leadership to the people. Some specific incentives and policy policies. We should encourage one-child family for the present time. Encourage, not mandate. 
but we should eliminate pro-natal tax incentives beyond the first child. We should have mild natal disincentives, encourage delaying and spacing pregnancies, and publicize the fact that many women can choose to have no children if they want to. This would be a new idea to a lot of people. Now, if we don't do it, if we don't do this, and I'm almost done now, if we don't curb our population ourselves, nature is going to do, us, do it for us and is doing it for us, but it does it in an inhumane way. Through famine, drought, and pestilence, massive fires globally, weather disasters, land exhaustion, submersion of land, desertification, mass migrations, riots, anarchy, and war. <clears throat> so it's going to be a race between whether do this, we do this by humane methods or whether does it, nature does it by its inhumane methods. And we've got to try to win that race. This is nature's way, inhumane way. And this is the way we want our babies to look when we intelligently modify our own reproductive policies. So in summary, it is in the nature of man, when inspired by competent leadership, to unite against a common enemy. We are now faced with a great and terrible enemy. If and when wise and courageous leadership arises, we can unite, and the battle against global warming may yet be won. Thank you very much for listening.